divergent who's from that. And I said, well, I'll do it with Jane. So, you know, and she, on her death certificate, all the information to the secretary of the Chamber of Commerce. Keeps you busy. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Ready to Whenever you guys are ready. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right. Might as well get started. We are live. So um, anyway, welcome the whole whopping two of you <laughs> to Passport to the Past, Bitter Battle, the election that changed Berrien County. I wanted to do this in April because April was the year was the month of the election um, that resulted in the switch of the county seat. So um, when I went into this, I had not planned on doing anything like this, but last year when I was doing some research for the um, sheriff's office, I kept coming across these articles from like 1894 or whatever, you know, sheriff showing up in 1894, still being here in Berrien Springs, and then that kind of like the rabbit hole going down to the next subject, and it was... So I found some of these articles from actually 1894 um, on newspapers.com. And these are all the St. Joe, but Harbor newspapers, which are what we're using today when we do the exhibit, we'll have others, but they were very petty. Like, like St. Joe was not at all conciliatory to this. They wanted it, they wanted it bad. As so I said, man, we should really do this. Now mind you, I proposed this like five months ago and I'm just finishing this today, but you know, whatever. It's like I haven't had anything going on. Anyway, so we're just going to do a few announcements before we get started. Um, so our next passport to the past is going to be the 19th of May, and that's going to be about Mary S. Coleman, who was the first woman to be elected to the Michigan State Supreme Court. Kathy Banfield Shaw wrote a huge article about her in Michigan History Magazine. We reached out to her, and she said she'd be happy to come down from Battle Creek to come talk about it, so we're very pleased for that. Um, our first crew at the courthouse will be here in the courthouse. Uh, we have not yet confirmed it, but if everything goes okay, we'll have an acapella group called the Lighthouse Chorus, and they will be here in the courthouse since this is a much better space for an acapella group um, versus <laughs> outside. But that will be our first one, and that'll be the last Friday in May. Um, we are also going to be closed on Sunday. Um, we've had some staff issues that we could not get the staff on Sunday. So we will be closed on Sunday, but we'll be back open next Wednesday per usual. And uh, we are gearing up for our collections project. We're almost done at the um, sheriff's residence. You gotta come see it. It's, it's totally different. Our current exhibit against the grain of wood in our daily lives is currently up. Feel free to come and look at that. We do have interactives um, and we are already planning for quarter three. Come on up, we're already here. Uh, quarter three, which is about the musical history of the House of David. So um, before I get started with this, a couple of things to kind of clarify for you as we go through this. At this time, they are not called county commissioners. They're called the Board of Supervisors. And they refer to places as towns versus village, township, city, you know, things like that. Um, so it took me a bit to figure out what they were talking about. So at this time, we're talking about 24, 25 supervisors because you had like Royal Team and we saw. So there, was, there weren't mass coverage like there currently is for the 12. So we actually at 12 commissioners have um, less representation across the county in numbers than we actually do, um, we did back in the day. So Royal Team would have had someone, Bering Springs, Buffalo, everyone had their own person. Um, 
I will also admit that we are only looking at the St. Joe newspapers. Now in the first half of the talk, that's fine because they were actually rather neutral about the 1880 issue, which I didn't even know about until I started reading this. And I'm like, wow, this is a very long, it did not, this whole desire to move the currency did not come out of the clear blue. This was a very long, nearly 20 year kind of conversation, actually 15 year, but 20 year conversation. Um, so we use a lot of the St. Joe ones. Now I am going to announce that in quarter two of next year, we are actually doing a whole exhibit about this subject. So we will get further into like the newspapers down in Buffalo, up in the upper part of the county. Uh, Niles has all, has pretty much, the library has a bunch of their newspapers digitized, which we were looking through. And so does Buchanan. Whatever they don't have digitized, we'll go back and look. But the years we were looking for, they did. I kept the, some of them in my my kind of my bitter battle pile. So I have them for next year. So we are a little biased when we get to 1894. But like I said, I thoroughly enjoy it because it's petty and funny and they insult each other. And if you think the, 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 the gist of this whole, <laughs> this whole talk tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is if you think that politics were a gentleman's sport back in the 1800s, you are highly, highly mistaken. I also want to apologize for the slowness of our laptop. I thought there was an issue with our laptop, and I was right. This laptop was sold to me with one memory card in it, so it's having a hard time running multiple things. So I am having um, to bite my tongue because I want to yell at it, and I can't because it's not socially appropriate words. So we're actually going to start, if you would go to the next one. At this point, I might even just get out of this because this is not working. Perfect. We're actually gonna start in the 1870s. So you're probably saying, Rena, why we start so far back. The reality is, is this, is this is not a battle, this is a war. This is a war, it's Berrien Springs against the county and all of this. And we have a couple of battles with the second battle being the one that essentially decides the fate. So these are some of the earliest rumblings I could find about moving the county seat. Now, what I like about the St. Joe paper, the St. Joe and Benton Harbor papers, especially in this early section, is they would actually reprint sections from other newspapers. So I was actually able to find information from papers I don't currently have access to. I called up the new Buffalo Library going, hey, what newspapers you got? She's like, nothing prior to 1900. I'm like, no, I need to go back 40 years earlier. <laughs> so this was great because I was able to find those segments that were related to it. I did a couple of word searches, including county seat and county seat and move. So I had a couple of conversations. There's gonna be a lot of sub conversations that um, search engine words I'm gonna have to use um, to kind of clarify a couple of things over the course of this. Nasty, I swear to God, if you don't stop it. So on the left here is actually a reprint from the Berrien Springs era. And at one point, Berrien Springs actually had two newspapers, the Berrien Springs Journal, the Berrien Springs era. And this is from the Berrien Springs era. Now, I am gonna say this, in the beginning here in the 1880s and all of this, we're gonna hear a lot about George Murdoch. George Murdoch was not a nice person about this. He was absolutely advocating for Berrien Springs, but he was very caustic about it. Um, but it was written in the era, which is here on the left, that, um, Apparently, there have been a, 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 some rumblings about the removal of the county seat. And this is where Murdoch first starts throwing out reasons why you shouldn't move the county seat. It's too expensive. It's going to take too long. It's really bad. We're doing fine. It's fine. You all being dramatic, it's fine. And so <laughs> if we, and he makes a comment here, which is a very, which is really arguably the number one Thing that goes through all of these articles and all of these arguments, even up until 1894. If we get a railroad, everything will be fine. And that's true, because the number one complaint people had was getting to Berrien Springs was difficult. There were very few roads into Berrien Springs, which ironically has not changed in 200 years, um, and that they were all terrible, which has changed. And um, if you add in like the winter, forget it, even taking a sleigh, a horse and sleigh, it was difficult to get here. And we'll see some rumblings in the 1880s after the first election that that still comes into play. And all of my, when I first started doing this, first of all, I was surprised to find out that there was anything, in, there was an election in 1880 about this issue. And that even though Niles was the primary, it, the vote was, do we move out of Berrien Springs into Niles or don't we? That was really what the election was about. 
The city that actually had quite a lot of rumblings was New Buffalo. It was New Buffalo that people thought should be the potential future county seat, which New Buffalo's over here going, the reason why is because they were actually a juncture for two of the railroads. So you had the Michigan Central along what is now Route 12, and then the Chicago and Michigan Lakeshore Railroad was going from in for like basically Michigan City up through Hager and all that up to South Haven. So really they were a convergence of two railroads. And later on in the 1880 election, I didn't use it in this exhibit, I didn't use it in this talk, but it will be in the exhibit. There was an article about how every township and community in Berrien County could get to a rail line to get to New Buffalo, but not everyone could get to Niles. It was the argument against Niles. So it is, so this is from the New Buffalo Independent. These are, one of my issues is a lot of these are very hard to read in general. So this is not just an issue with my projector, it's in general. But at the bottom, it makes a comment about how um, <laughs> New Buffalo will have two or more railroad. I said, by the, should you wait for a railroad to the county seat until you get it in this way, in that way, New Buffalo will have two more railroads and a first class harbor and the independent will have as many readers as there are now people in Berrien County. And even if you will have to move the county seat in order to get a railroad to it, so they're saying you have to literally move the seat. They're not advocating themselves, not yet, but they're saying you're gonna have to move it to a rail line. The rail line is not gonna come there. And they're already at this point going, <laughs> nice try guys, you're not gonna get it. Go on with your narrow gauge. Go on with your narrow gauge. It is your only hope. Thank you, Princess Lynn. We appreciate it. So they are literally at this early stage, first of all, not believing that Barry Springs is gonna get a railroad, which is prophetic. But they also are talking about how everybody else, they're going to have to move the county seat to a rail line community versus a rail line coming in. And it, I call it prophetic, but it was really just assessing the situation. Berrien Springs is in a great area centrally, but it's also geographically not a position to accept heavy rail lines. As we see, we don't really have much in the way of rail lines around here. The interurban worked because it was a narrow gauge and it was lighter weight and it was much faster. The technology was much better by the time the interurban came. So we're gonna jump ahead to the next year, the 1877. These are three different articles. And right up in the upper left, it says, JP, JP Howlett of Niles visited this section of the county, St. Joe, and talked up matters in regard to the removal of the county seat to Niles. Now, one of the things that fascinated me is Niles was always the number one choice, the New Buffalo number two. St. Joe and Benton Harbor don't really come into the conversation. There was a little rumbling that maybe, maybe Benton Harbor a few years later, but it was always Niles or New Buffalo. The Twin Cities, or as I like to refer to them, Cain and Abel, were not, had, no, had no kind of play into this. The one below it, speaking of the removal of the county seat to Niles, the mirror says, which is the Niles mirror, it is said that the Niles people will vote 40 or 50,000 for the building. One thing is quite certain, the people are tired of driving through the mud to Berrien, hiring horses kept, and there will be a railroad to Berrien or there will be a removal of the county, removal sooner or later. It is, probably, it is probable no one will object to submitting the question to the people. So this is a number that's gonna come up numerous times in this, this talk. 50,000 was the magic number. Niles said, we can do it, we can raise the money. You don't have to do anything, county. We will do it all. We will raise the $50,000 and make it possible for the county seat to come here. We will build your new county courthouse. And so that's something that they're kind of playing up, the financials. So, so here you have George Murdoch going, no, nah, this is too expensive. And Niles going, no, it's not. We got the money. We can do this. And so even if the cost of the building isn't quite 50,000, that still leaves some money for the transportation of everything over. The one on the left, the St. Joseph Society Herald, um, this one actually kind of talks about, it's hard to read, obviously. It's even hard to read when I'm face up against the computer. But this quotes the Buchanan record. The Buchanan record has a couple of things. There's a child that was killed in a gunshot wound or whatever. But then it says that if the county seat must be moved, there's only one valid answer. 
New Buffalo. Buchanan and Niles are like this. They are this close to each other. And the entire time for this half of the war, Buchanan said, no, 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 it needs to be New Buffalo. And Niles got mad about that. As we got closer to 18, and you're like, really? There was one of them that the Niles, there was one of them that was reprinted the Niles going, you literally are 18 minutes by rail from us. Why would you want to move the county seat further away from you? But Buchanan felt because there were a convergence that New Buffalo would be better for the entire county versus really just the lower half, which, which, which is a huge argument um, that the upper half of the county will kind of get cut off. They're going to have to go all the way down, all the way over. There's, you know, you're, if you're saying there's going to be no direct line, then I have to go, if you're in SOTUS or you're in Hager Township or you're in Coloma, you have to go over and down and over. Someone made the dramatic decision, it's 100 miles to get to Niles from them. Like, really? There's no... You can, there's no 100 miles in Marion County, even if you drive up and down, up and down, up and down all day. So they're very, very dramatic about it. But there was also actually this kind of bit of a impression that if the county seat moved to Niles, then you're essentially cutting the county in half. And someone's like, well, the upper half of the county then has to go through all these hoopla do to get to Niles. And everybody else in the South County is like, whoop, there they go, right to Niles along the rail line. Michigan Central. It's there. <clears throat> I knew it was coming. So <laughs> what they ended up doing is setting off kind of this almost dramatics, like, oh my God, if we do this, we'll have to split the county in half and then we'll be two counties and what would be the county seat for the upper half of Berrien County? Was, people were getting, no, people have always been dramatic. Facebook and social media has not made it worse. It just made it more global. Now people in Shanghai could see you go crazy. Back then it was just in the newspapers. All right, so now we're in 1877, 1878. On the left-hand side, the Nile, this is fascinating. The Nile's mirror of Wednesday says, Brother Murdoch of the Bering Springs Journal gave us a call on Saturday. He came up here over the sandy and muddy roads to see how much people and horses had to suffer annually into going to the county seat. And although the roads were comparatively good, to what they are generally, he did not wonder that the people wanted their county seat on a railroad. He thinks, however, when it is removed, which is interesting because he's very vocal about it not being moved. So it's hard to say if Niles is putting words in George's mouth or if George was kind of admitting that this is a potential. He thinks, however, when it's removed, it will be to St. Joseph. He was prophetic. That would suit the South better than Berrien. So he's actually saying, okay, I can see why this is a problem, but I don't think you guys are gonna get it. I think it's gonna go to St. Joe, which is interesting because in the battle, bet <laughs> the battle between St. Joe and George would come out in 1894. One of the things that was very fascinating is as this conversation starts ramping up, starts ramping up, starts ramping up, is <laughs> I can't tell if it's a jokingly way or if people were serious about this, We'd get these sections in the Herald and in the Palladiums where, like I said, they were reprints from other newspapers or reports they'd received from communities. This one's in Bridgman. Lumber is on the ground for a new dwelling on Main Street. We like to see this for every new building adds so much more to the wealth of our little town. By the way, they're very dramatic in the 1800s and I love it. Who knows, but that Bridgman may yet be the county seat of Berrien County and the envy of our sister towns. Now to be very fair, <laughs> Bridgman is kind of in a halfway point along, you know, the county. It's a little bit south of the Twin Cities. But this is, they're at a point where, like, anybody can take the county seat. Like, anything, anything would be better than Berrien Springs. So you've got little towns like Bridgman who got, like, four billions going, well, you could be the county seat. Nice aspirations for a small town. The far left one, or the far right one, is very hard to read. Um, <coughs> but I liked it because... This was January 12th, 1878. And it was in the, there was a St. Joseph Saturday Herald and then the Herald, and they were printed a lot of the same columns. Um, this is a whole column. It's a column and a half about a board of supervisors meeting a week prior. So this is January 5th, 1878. 
During this session, um, they actually talked about, the supervisors talked about the county seat removal for the very first time in these records. And like seriously talking about like, well, maybe we need to move it, maybe we don't. They're actually having a real, theoretically a real conversation about it. During this session, several supervisors put forth their own communities as a potential county seat location. Mary Field of Waterville went first where he proposed Coloma as the new location, which I thought was fascinating because I thought he would have chosen water relief, but he said Coloma. That was the only thing other than the very last element. That was the only proposal that was actually voted on for like moving the county seat. And it was a vote of nine to eight. <laughs> Given how close this was, this is obviously a signal that the supervisors are more open to having this conversation. And essentially it opened up this flood field. After Maryfield talked, Lambert of Niles put forth his own resolution reminding the county that the city of Niles was ready to take on the responsibility and they could raise the 50,000 needed to buy a new county building. He had three other supervisors at that time support his resolution, but no vote was taken. Lambert was followed by Fox from Buchanan. Now this is what fascinates me because in the papers, so the, variant, the Buchanan record and the other Buchanan newspapers were advocating heavily for New Buffalo to get it. But Fox went ahead and put forth a resolution for Buchanan to receive it. And he said that we too could raise $50,000 if you give it to us. Now, Niles kept kind of put this asterisk when they said they could do that. They said, guarantee the county seat. So I want to, as I go through the Niles papers, I'm kind of hoping in this time period, maybe I can find some early plans. But it sounded like Niles was doing no movement on anything until they were sure they were going to get the county seat. They felt it was not worth their time. They could do it, but they, want, they weren't going to waste more time than necessary, which actually, given that's a lot of taxpayer dollars for a community in 1878, 1879, that's, I don't blame the, the people getting a little, the leaders of Niles going, we can do it, but we need a guarantee before we start. Um, so Fox received some support, but no vote was taken. And the final commissioner to put forth a resolution for the location with Glavin of New Buffalo. So this is the first time New Buffalo is advocating for itself, at least that I've been able to find verbally in a very kind of place. And what's interesting is the latter quarter of the left-hand side of that article is all Glavin. They actually recorded Glavin's word, which was fascinating to me because they didn't record any of the other conversations for Fox or Lambert or Maryfield was why they should be there. They just kind of said, here's the resolution, which tells me this is an unofficial nod to New Buffalo as potentially what they would see, or at least St. Joe would be interested in having because it's a straight shot down in New Buffalo for them. Glavin said, the location which we offer you at New Buffalo is at, at the top or apex of the triangle formed by the Michigan Central, the Michigan and the Chicago and Michigan Lakeshore Railroad and the county line on the east. It is readily accessible to the people from all towns from Waterville South and from miles west by railroad. We offer you all the land you want, all the land you want for the county buildings free. Now, because we already had county buildings here, they were working on the assumption that they need county buildings for the new county seat. Obviously that was not true because obviously you know how much room you need. So only a courthouse would theoretically be needed. But they said, <laughs> you can build as many buildings as you want. You get the land for free. We will give you a magnificent site overlooking the beautiful waters of Lake Michigan and elevated 60 feet above its level and a piece of magnificent possibilities. Now I'm gonna pause here a second. And one of the, John and I had the most hysterical laughing moment yesterday when I was reading through a lot of this, but there were several of these articles that talked about how Berrien County was the wealthiest of the counties in Michigan. I don't know if that's true. I'm just saying that's what the newspapers are saying. But if it is true that there's a lot of wealth coming through Berrien County, it would make sense that they're kind of appealing to these beautiful views of the lake because we're at a time frame when people are starting to think about beauty and location for their county seat. They want a place that's beautiful. They want a place that's attractive. Because when we talk about this building, in 1839 terms, at least, this was a magnificently impressive building for the time. It was big, it was huge, it was impressive. So they're still thinking this way in 1879, but they're thinking, you can have great views of Lake Michigan from the judges, you know, <laughs> whatever, which theoretically they, they did in 1896 and the, 19, the 1967, the current courthouse, all have these great views of the lake and the river. 
Um, but he's playing on that kind of that vanity of we have a very beautiful place, this wonderful location. He goes on to say later, I will. <laughs> He goes on to say later, I won't wish to say any unkind things against the city of Niles. We are all proud of her. She is the commercial metropolis of Berrien County. In fact, Niles bears the same relation to Berrien County that Boston does the universe. She is the hub. But Mr. Chair, <laughs> but Mr. Chairman, though she has a great many things to recommend her as a county seat yet, in my opinion, she lacks the most essential thing of all. She is not geographically location. She does not the geographical location that would suit the majority of the people. Eventually, he stops talking, and I'm assuming <laughs> that this caused a bit of an uproar. Those that would support Niles, or obviously Lambert from Niles, is probably a little bit of an uproar. Being told that you might be the center of the universe, but you're still not good enough for the county seat, because the next person to stand was Carlton of Royalton, who decided to put forth a vote to postpone the discussion indefinitely which passed 12 to nine. <laughs> do we blame them? No, we do not. So we have really one of the first examples of New Buffalo really kind of coming into play. But as they made the resolution to go ahead and send it to the county to vote in 1880, there was no more discussion about New Buffalo. It really was centered on Niles. Um, so the railroad played a huge role. This, this need for a railroad cannot be understated at all. Um, and during this time, a railroad by the name of the St. Joseph Valley Company was like, I think we can get a line to you guys. But they were talking more of a short gauge or a small gauge line, which is not very big and can't carry as many people or go nearly as fast as some of the bigger ones can. But the idea that they could at least get something from Bertrand or Buchanan up to Berrien Springs, at the very least, gives them the access that was needed. And then there was kind of a bit of a conversation. Well, if we can get to Berrien Springs, then maybe we can go to Benton Harbor and continue the, the, the trail line. There was also a conversation about how maybe instead of from Buchanan, it comes from the, e or from the west in Stevensville, straight across. So here are four, these are four of them in 1879, and this is the last year before we have the first battle. Um, <laughs> the top left is kind of talking about this need for a railroad, that it needs to happen. Without it, the, there's no question the county seat's gonna have to move. But underneath it, this is a converse, this is something we see quite a bit over the next 10 years, and it gets snottier and bitter every year that this keeps going on. Some of our county exchanges are again beginning to talk removal of the county seat. If the people of Bering Springs know what is best for themselves, they will secure railroad facilities as soon as possible. So here you have all these other communities going, Bering Springs, you need to get a real, like they're almost talking like there's a child, like they're talking down to them like they're a child. On the right hand side, top Three Oaks Independent, the citizens of New Buffalo held a meeting on Saturday in reference to the removal of the county seat. That's right, keep the ball rolling. So here you have Three Oaks even going, hey, we really need to keep this going, keep the talk going, we gotta get the move. The county record from the Buchanan, uh, the county news for the Buchanan record of October 9th, um, there's a couple of things. Um, there's apparently citrons are coming, citra and citrus are coming. New Buffalo proposes to, to donate grounds for the county buildings, provided the county seat may be moved to that place liberal souls. They should have it and probably will unless that railroad is built across the county before long. So as you can see, the, the railroad keeps popping up, the railroad keeps popping up, and no one is having any faith in Berrien Springs. And to be very fair, the, histori the historicalness is, is, the historicity is not there. They just don't have a history of it. So this is beginning in 1880. Um, and this is when the first battle occurs. <laughs> So on January, um, it was like January 5th of 1880, which is on the right, the following was adopted as a canard by a two thirds vote. Now I was a little confused because canard means duck in French. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Turns out in politics, a canard is considered an untruth used to kind of obscure or mislead your voters. And it's very, <laughs> it's very fascinating to me because the, the, the Saturday Herald is like, 
And they adopted the resolution by two thirds vote. That was the resolution would be that the question of the county seat is to be submitted to the people at the spring elections, which is April in 1880, and that the point designated be city of Nile. So at this point, the board of supervisors is saying, we're gonna have this election and you're gonna vote whether to stay where it is or move it to Niles, no other options. Now, a few weeks prior, the Buchanan record kind of talked about how if future means prove fruitless, you may as well hang up the hatchet and say the old way of traveling to and from the county. So there's this conversation on the narrow gauge, Buchanan saying, you know, the remove, this that means a removal of the county seat and removal means two counties instead of one. So they're getting a little dramatic. They're like, oh my God, if we remove it to Niles, we'll have two counties. And actually one of them said there'd be an even 16 counties for each. <laughs> <laughs> for each county if they split Berrien County into two. Like they were getting very, some people were like, oh my God, we'll be two counties. Can we handle that? Would they be able to, I'm like, those are crazy. Chill. So they're basically saying it has to be done. We have to do something about it. And then a few weeks later, they say yes. So Carlton from Royalton offered an amendment to place, <laughs> surprisingly, in Waterville, and A.L. Drew moved that it should be New Buffalo instead. Those were both struck down and it remained Niles as the location. It says later, by a vote of 11 to 10, the, the above resolution has been sustained and the question of removal will be submitted to the people. So it's very interesting that the, the, the Saturday Herald considers that first part of that meeting to be like kind of a bit of a, a bit of a political farce, but then say, oh no, it's actually gonna happen. And so this sets off three months of, you know, the first of the bitter battles. And so the election was set for eight, uh, April 2nd, I believe that year, um, definitely early April. Um, this is slide, so try and make sure I'm with my notes. So there's two guys here. Again, the, both of these are hard to read, but I, and I came across so many good articles, but I only picked a few because, well, brevity is a bit of the soul, but not mine. Um, so I just want to kind of keep it short in a little bit. And more of these, like I said, will show up in the exhibit. Um, the lengthy comic section on the left here was mostly a response to the announcement that at long last a vote would be held in the county seat removal. The Niles mayor felt there was nothing more, there was nothing more just than this. Finally, justice is being served. The people will get a chance to say whether or not they want to stay in Berrien Springs. And again, the drama of the 1800s, that the residents had a right to decide whether or not they, or generations unborn, shall be forced to wade through mud and trudge over sand hills to the county seat. Now, obviously they're being dramatic in a lot of ways, but they are not being dramatic about how terrible the route this is. They are clearly making it very clear that they're not even imagining like there could be future road improvements. They are stuck on the railroad. And interesting, only the railroad. Because John and I had a conversation about how at no point in time during this conversation in either one of the elections that the river could be a potential transportation. You can come down to the mouth of the river and go down the river and you're in, you know, there you are. You're in, you know, Berrien Springs. Or go across and come up because it's only a few minutes down the river. Not a, not a single conversation about the river. And I, as far as I know, at least in the, the ones we have, maybe Berrien Springs proposed it. It very fascinates me their obsession with the railroad is because they're obsessed with like this very advanced technology that they had. The middle section of that left side is the Benton Harbor Times that felt the following town should vote unanimously for the removal. Waterville, Bainbridge, Hager, Benton, St. Joe, Royalton, Lincoln, Lake, Weesaw, Chickaming, New Buffalo, Three Oaks, Galeen, Buchanan, Bertrand, and Niles. They believe this, they should vote unanimously because they're on the rail lines, which means it's easily accessible. <laughs> With the exception of Bainbridge, we saw in Royalton, they were not on the rail line, but they were like just above it. It's like one town over, so it was very easy for them to get to the rail line. <clears throat> they felt that Pipestone, Sodus, Berrien, and Orinoco would always remain remote from the rail lines and that Pipestone and Sodus should just trudge through the mud to Niles as they do Berrien Springs. So basically they're like, they're really kind of pushing the majority of them who are going to have the best access to vote unanimously because they'd be the bulk of the people. And sorry, Sodas, you're just going to have to suffer. Poor Sodas, totally forgot. Um, at the very bottom, the Traveler Herald in St. Joe did go against the grants that it should say in Berrien Springs, providing the rail line was added. And it, which is obviously we've been saying that's common, but it's very fascinating because at this point, everyone's like, no, 
go to Niles. And they're saying, well, we're gonna buck the trend here. We still think it should be, but obviously with this cravat. All right, fine. The second half of their, um, Niles is starting to get, this is, I like this. I wish I could read it a little bit better, but this side, Niles is getting mad because New, Buchanan's still like, it should have been your buffalo. And Niles is like, excuse me, it should be us. And there must have been some very massive propaganda coming from Berrien Springs because the Republican claims that they don't want to war with Berrien Springs. Obviously, Bering Springs is wanting a war, but they, we will not. The popular sentiment shows that people want to move. The Democrat is trying in their section is saying, no, it's not going to be expensive. We're taking care of the cost, blah, blah, blah. So they're clearly responding to George's propaganda, 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 propaganda damn internet, um, that's going out there. So what's very interesting is during this time frame, Bering Springs isn't showing up because when I did county seat, Obviously, Bering Springs, when we talk about the county seat, they really kind of kept, St. Joe kind of kept Bering Springs' you know, portion out of this. So it'd be very interesting to see how down and dirty George was getting because he kind of got a little on the nasty side. Um, more specifically, only a few weeks after the commissioners, had, or the supervisors, had voted to move the seat. This whole sec, this is a smaller section of that bigger mm -hmm. article, which had all of this stuff about, it was like all this stuff about the county seat. This occurred, now those two that we just saw were a little bit later, they were February. I'm going back to January because George really could have cost Barry and Springs the county seat because he was getting vicious in the journal. Vicious. See, and at this, and he actually crossed a line here, which I would say we cross a modern line. The ethics of modern journalism cross a line. Back in those days, this was a battle royale. So the middle line, the middle column, which is this side, and about right about here, is all an is all an editorial written by Edwin Cook, who at the time <laughs> was the um, county clerk. And George Murdoch openly in the journal accused Cook of instigating this election. We're having an election because you got into a secret little room with someone and pushed it through. Like that's literally one of the things he says that you, that you allowed this vote to happen, even though four of the commissioners were missing and that could have made a difference in the voting. You're, you're shady. You're trying to steal this. You're trying to steal the county seat from Varian Springs. Cook was mad. And so this is one of the nastiest articles I think I've ever read, but at the top, I love. Berrien Springs, January 17th, 1888. So this is only about, set, about a week prior to when this is printed. Mr. Ed, and this is all from Edwin Cook. He wrote this. Mr. Editor, I clipped the following from the Berrien Springs Journal of this date, which is the January 17th. The average man in Berrien Springs is a queer critter and might heart, might, mighty hard to please. The journal last week said that some of the residents of that lovely, if not lively village, Turt had turned over a new leaf on New Year's Day and publicly pledged themselves to stop lying. And now come these fellows and deny the journal statement. Now, what is a bewildered public to think, the Nile Republican, or Niles Republican? What have they not stopped? What, why that they have not stopped to be sure? That last sentence is an original remark by the editor of the, jur the journal, George H. Murdoch Esquire, now I'm glancing over the column of this paper. I am most thoroughly convinced that the said editor at least has not stopped, but that can be done and does lie as much with as much ease of conscience in 1880 as in 1879 or any previous year of grace. And it just goes downhill from there. So they are done. They are, they're, George is attacking everyone, ever, it's the world against Berrien Springs. You're trying to steal the county seat from us. You're just, you're, 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 you're a bad person. And Kevin Cook's like, bro, you're crazy. And here's why. So he actually does that. All of those, that column and a half that's dedicated to that is literally Edwin's response to what George has said. It's literally line number one, line number two, line number three, there's like five of them. And then even though it's covered in the fifth column, there is a couple of um, comments from one of the other communities that said, we stand with Edwin Cook. George Murdoch stepped over the line on that one. 
So if the election had happened around then, George Murdoch would have caused Berrien Springs, likely, because people were so against George and therefore saw Berrien Springs in a bad light that it wouldn't have mattered. They would have absolutely taken him out. And I love it. It's, it's a level of petty I aspire to be, I have to admit. So this is 1880, and there's three articles here. And this is kind of, um, we're, we're heading in. These are all in February. We're now, we're now moving past the shock of it. Yes, we're getting in there. Top, great efforts are being made to lead the people of the county to believe that the citizens at this place do not intend to build a railroad that the present movement is only intended to affect the county seat question. So people are actually accusing Bering Springs of lying about getting a railroad to keep the county seat. Although it's very interesting because at this point in time, they're finishing, they're starting the layout of the, um, the, short, rate, the short gauge rail line for the St. Joe, uh, Joe Valley, which would then go active a few months later when the weather was nicer. But they're being accused of lying about this. Down below, the Three Oaks Independent now favors the removal of the county seat to Niles. Next. So like you guys, I'm like, whatever. The Three Oaks is on board. And then on the far right, Mr. Hemlick, uh, Mr. B. Hemlick of Orinoco informs your correspondent that the people of Orinoco has subscribed uh, $25,000 and the individuals in Buchanan Township $14,000 towards the construction of the railroad from, from the state line in Bertrand to Berrien Springs. So they already have around, so 39,000 was being dedicated already towards the building of this railroad. And so now the propaganda, propaganda, propaganda. I don't know, I'm having trouble with that word today. Um, they are trying to be like, hey, you know, this is what it's supposed to be. We've got this going on, the building's going successfully. And there's not too much going on in March, but then in April, I found this. The official canvas of the votes for and against removal of the county seat showed the following result. Total votes cast was 7,080, which ironically is about how many people vote in Marion County today. Nothing's changed. Um, but the majority against removal was 3,766. So despite the kind of comments about how, well, maybe Marion Springs is lying, this, that, and the other about the railroad, there were enough people who were convinced that the St. Joe Valley was gonna succeed and therefore they'd have easier access getting to the county seat and really probably the cost. I mean, even though Niall said they carry the cost, voters still tend to be very wary about certain elections or amendments that may potentially cost them. What if it's more? Well, then the county is on the seat for that. For the next 12 years or 12 years, we got a lot of grumblings in, in, in going on. And in, 18, <laughs> in 1885, the Bering Springs Talisman has quoted the suggestion of the Palladium for a town meeting here in St. Joe to talk up the county seat. And this Talisman says, we object. The five years discussion as to where the county seat will be located does not take place until after people vote to move it. So five years after this election, they're still going, can we talk about moving it? We really should talk about moving it. And this is a point in time when the St. Joe Valley Railroad is going through some kind of a bit of a rough patch. So it's not a surprise that this is starting to pop up. Underneath it said several citizens were present to enlist the attention of the board in the matter of the removal of the county seat. After an informal discussion was decided to hold a public meeting at Conkey's Opera House, the proceedings of which are published elsewhere. I actually have to look for Conkey's Opera House to find those results because it wasn't popping up. Uh, but that was a little bit later in December, 1885. Two years later, Judge Potter, Tried the old way of going to Barron Springs Monday by sleigh. This is January 18th, so this is dead Michigan winter. And upon his immediate return, declared it was too bad to have the county seat situated in the backwoods, a way out of civilization. And if he was judge, he would never pass sentence on anyone who would steal the records and move them to a place on a railroad. The judge is correct. So here you have a very prominent person in the county going, this is ridiculous. I can't, I have to go down here and, and, and pass judgment for the county courthouse. You know what? I'm not saying it should happen, but if anybody wants to steal anything, I'm not gonna go against you. Which is huge, a judge be like, I'll turn a blind eye to adjust the law of court to get it out of Berrien Springs. Below it was one of several types of articles I would find beginning about 18, 1889 was one of the first ones I saw. This one I pulled from 1891 was a lot clearer, one of the more clearer ones. 
and I saw them up until 1893. For marriage licenses, apply to Scrim or Scrimmer and Finnegan and save expense of a trip to the county seat. So people are like, I will literally pay extra to a middleman to go and get my marriage license because I do not want to go to Berrien Springs because it's too much. And that says something. If you're that lovey-dovey, you will move mountains for your lover, but you will not go to Berrien Springs. Um, this is 1893. So this is the last part of the year of 1893, November and December. On the left, unquestionably, the county seat should be moved to a more available location. And undoubtedly, the best place for it will be one of, one of these two cities. So this is St. Joe now promoting very, or promoting that, which you did not see too much in 1880 or Harley at all. Like I said, if it did pop up, it was actually Benton Harbor. One of these two cities. The marsh location between the towns should be abandoned for many good reasons, chief of which is the fact that the idea as heretofore advanced has met with decided disfavor throughout the county. Basically, people are mad that it's in Berrien Springs. On one of the beautiful bluffs, either directly in St. Joseph or Benton Harbor, the, newly, the new county house ought to be located, and the people of the whole county should work together to secure this desirable, long-needed, and timely improvement. So this is going to be the last time we see um, the Palladium, the Herald, any of the St. Joe newspapers be neutral about it. We should have it. We, it's about time that we make these changes. Once we get to 1894, all bets are off. They're all mean to each other. To the right, we would suggest that Sawyer move for the county seat. It would be such an accommodation for some of our townsmen who have so much business in Barry and Spring. And so again, here we have yet another town going, why not we take it? We're on a rail line, we'll be fine, we'll be great. All right, 1894. Um, ignore my comments here. I actually switched the two articles and forgot to switch those. So on the left-hand side is from March 3rd, 1894. I had a hard time finding a good version of this. Um, and sadly, this was the best one. Um, what it is, and it's hard to read, but it's an election notice. It started, it started up on February 24th. The first publication was February 24th. And it's set to run in the newspaper every week until March 31st, which is basically the last week before the election. And it says that the state of Michigan in the county of Berrien, as to the electors of the county of Berrien, state of Michigan, you're hereby notified that the annual township election to be held in the several townships and city wards of said county on Monday, the second day of April, AD, <laughs> 1894, there will be um, submitted to the electors of the said county a proposition for the removal of the county seat of said county from its present location at the village of Berrien Springs, the city of St. Joseph um, in said county in accordance with the following resolution. And it goes on to the resolution, which was adopted um, January 5th, 1894. The minute this resolution hit the papers, the minute it passed in the Board of Supervisors, St. Joe is on it. The county seat removal question at the, uh, at the county seat this week, by the way, they really need to find another phrase. This is sort of starting to look a little weird. This week has simply emphasized the fact that when the Twin Cities at the mouth of the St. Joe River pull together, they can get about anything they may desire. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. And they deserve it, for here's where the great increase of population and taxable property has been for many years. And here is where the mass of people center a great part of the year for business, health, and pleasure, which is true. This is now becoming a major tourist town. And mine, friend, just let us add that here at the mouth of the St. Joe is sure to be not many years hence one great and prosperous city, just the place for the county seat. So put on your best bib and tucker, Miss Benton Harbor, and join Mr. St. Joseph in preparing the invitations to the rest of the county come to the Jubilee party in the early spring. First of all, yes, the gendering of the cities cracks me up. What's fascinating about this is if you know your Barron County history, two years prior, these cities were at each other's throats over the city charters, right? Because the suggestion had been the cities should merge. And St. Joe's like, yes, I like this idea. And Benton Harbor's like, no. 
And this is where I tell people, I said, they're not Twin Cities or Cain and Abel because they, it was, I actually found a couple of things around this time period in the 1892 time period, I was looking for the grumblings about like St. Joe and Ben Harbor attacking each other about this. And so here you have, so it's St. Joe's pretty, St. Joe's convinced the rest of the county is so sick and tired of it being in Marion Springs, they're gonna win it. But what they need is the people of Benton Harbor to back them up. We need, it's a populous city. We need that population. And if they, that's, whether or not that will be the make or break has been speculated as the make or break. But what fascinates me is even as they are trying to woo Benton Harbor to come join them and be part of this election, they're insulting Benton Harbor by calling it Miss. Miss Benton Harbor, get your tucks and get your bibs. Like if I, I mean, it explains so much about why these two cities are each other's friends all these years. There's, there's no twins here. And if they, again, they're siblings, not twins. So this is them trying so desperately to get Benton Harbor to join them. And while they're wooing Benton Harbor and talking about how wonderful Benton Harbor is, they are hating on Niles. I mean, hater to the core. So this is all from the same article. So the article's on the left, this is a middle section, this is the end. This article, I have to go back to double check in the Niles newspaper, but Niles was saying, no, no, we should be allowed to have it. We used to be one of the county seats. We were gonna be able to do it in 1880. However, our only concern is the cost is not gonna be $300,000. So it's maybe the rest of the country to help us on this. <laughs> and St. Joe went for the jugular. So we believe, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, the anti room. So what they're doing on the top in the middle section are reproductions of things that the, the, the Democrat, which is now at this time the reporter, the Buchanan, or the Niles reporter, what they wrote in 1880 about Niles being the county seat. And St. <laughs> Joe comes like, we can do it. We are able to do it. Oh, an awful expense to them to have the county seat removed. Now this is but another of their deceiving schemes to influence popular sentiment. So they're responding to Berrien Springs. They're saying it's expensive. We say it's not. So they must, so then it, St. Joe comes back and goes, Nile said that 50,000 was sufficient to build the county buildings in Niles in 1880. But now her papers are trying to blind the people to county by saying that it's over 300,000 is necessary to do the same thing. Uh, same thing at St. Joseph in 1894. Voters can see through the skimmer. And then at the bottom, said, the very, very bottom is this little section here. Our Niles neighbors in speaking for their city in 1880 speaks many sensible and effective words for St. Joseph in 1894. So, what's, so at this point, Niles is trying to desperately kind of stick to it. It's like, well, we're still here. So it's gonna be more expensive. And St. Joe's like, 50,000, we can do it. We're fine. And in fact, in another edition of the paper, a little bit later in May, as a couple days later, was this, again, it's a little hard to see, three columns dedicated to conversation, most of it to the, Saint, the courthouse thing. And then they had three pictures. There's the two, top two I pulled out because it's this building, but the bottom one is a recreation drawing of the Allegiant County Courthouse, which cost Allegiant 46,000 just a few years prior. So what they're doing, so the bulk of the, <laughs> The bulk of this is literally them making fun of Niles. Oh, 300,000? How can you say it? Look, a legion did it for 46. We can do it for 500,000. And they even went so, go so far as to say, not only can we do it for $50,000, but ladies and gentlemen, it's hard to see, but this very long on my list here are people in St. Joe, and I guess to the great Bent Harbor, who have pledged to cover the bond for a total of 50,500. And we have some big names here, yours on there, Graham's on there, the Morton Graham Company, Morton himself. Morton himself and the Morton Graham each pledged $1,000. You only pledged 500. Has the courthouse, is the, uh, the opera house burned, hasn't burned down yet, has it? Okay, so we're still a couple of years out. So he got, he got money for, you know, to, you got 500 floating around to give. So we have, there's at least 19 individuals or businesses who pledge $1,000 each. All the rest on that list is 500, totaling 50,500. So they're coming back to kind of saying, 
Oh, <laughs> we have people who will pay for it. Not even our taxpayers have to pay for it. We have people who will do so. And big people, big names. Um, I'm not as familiar with St. Joe history to pull out any more names. I was just looking for the ones that stood out to me. So your and Graham and all of that. What I do like about it is they have this drawing done of this courthouse and the exterior image isn't too bad, but the lower image cracks me up. So it's a hand-drawn image of the entrance to our stairs here. Elegant, isn't it? So the stairs are all wonky. There's a pile of wood right in the corner. That's what you're seeing when you walk in. Giant crack in the landing wall, which interestingly enough, is still there. How historic of us. So they're framing the courthouse, which at this point is about 55 years old, as basically a janky building that just needs to be put down. And again, if we go back to what we were talking about earlier, fashionability is what people are looking for. They want the fancy looking Gothic style like a legion has. And obviously we know what the 1896 courthouse looked like. So that's what they went for. Um, so you're like, no, no, that's just too bad. It's terrible. And it's, it's an ugly building and it's just old. We need something better. This is St. Joseph Saturday Herald, April 7th, 1894. And um, this is one, five days after the election. I'm trying to find my picture, I got my notes. The election came and went on April 2nd as promised and unlike 1888, the county's desire with Bering Springs was evident. St. Joe won by a landslide. I was unable to find in the search where I conducted the final votes, but I'll, I'll look up a couple of locations. I, have to, I think it's the combination of words I'm using. I couldn't find the vote. And if I use the word election, I will never find anything to be more precise. Um, in comparison with the almost haughty tones of St. Joe's previous articles, this is very conciliatory. My favorite thing about this is they still have managed to get one more slap in denials. <laughs> Monday night witnessed the close of one of the most earnest and prolonged contests that was ever experienced in this part of the state. For years, the people of the county have been greatly dissatisfied with the location of their county seat. They have clamored long and loud for better facilities for reaching it, for a change, for a change if they could not be given them. And a second time since it was lo and for a second time since it was located at Berrien Springs, they were afforded a chance on Monday last under a most unfavorable conditions of the county to pass judgment on the wisdom of change. The subject was fully discussed in the past three months, and then came the ballot box. On Monday, the people voted and Monday night, the count was announced in a safe margin in favor of the return of the county's capital to its birthplace. I will pause here and say, the, there was no true, Berrien Springs is the original recognized county seat of Berrien County. Before that, it kind of moved around. It was in Niles for a bit. It was kind of in St. Joe for a bit. It bounced around. There was no official seat. So Niles having a claim to it in 1880 made sense. St. Joe in 1894 made sense. But St. Joe's not entirely correct. They were not the original county seat. They were not a recognized county seat by the state. Sorry about you. Anyway, where it will be more <laughs> conveniently reached and where good, building, where good buildings will be erected was shown. It should be sufficient. It will be sufficient. And in due time, the verdict of the people will be carried into effect. Our Berrien Springs neighbors made a gallant fight against the odds to retain the honor that has so long been her own, and we honor her for it. But the best intentions of the county demanded removal, and it has come to it has come because it is right. As for Niall, she is condemned out of her own mouth by the, in, the inconsistency that she's displayed in the question. So they're like, it's your own fault. You lost. You were inconsistent. I love it. I love it. They're so petty to each other. Um, by the inconsistency she displayed on the question and the falsehood and abuse that have been sent forth from her borders against the good name of a neighbor who deserved at least respectful treatment and a showing of gratitude on her part. So they're literally saying that Niles deserved to be nicer to St. Joe, despite the fact that St. Joe is, a, is being hateful to them in the newspapers. Um, but it came not, yet St. Joseph is content. So they're saying, it's fine. We're okay with it. You can have your moment. She saw an honor that was worthy of her best efforts and she won the day. She will be in, in the future show that the, con, the, con, the confidence, I hate this print. It's so hard to read sometimes. She will in future show that the, con, 
the confidence of the county has not been misplaced. For those throughout the county who honestly differ, who honestly differed with us, we have only the kindest feelings and trust they too will come to realize that the people have chosen wisely. Well, again, oh, you said no to us. <laughs> That's okay you'll find the error of your way eventually. Like it is even in their gloriousness and their win, their clear win, they could not be conciliatory. I'm like, you know what? The only thing they can say is nicely about Barry Springs. To hell with the rest of you who didn't like us because we deserve this. It's wonderful. St. Joseph salutes the grand old Barry, uh, grand old Barry and tips her hat to her twin across the river and the um, sturdy ones who stood a shoulder to shoulder with them in the march to victory. I also find it very fascinating that they're like, oh, by the way, thanks Benton Harbor. <laughs> like not even, a, not even a thing. So on the left here, St. Joseph wins and the county seat of Varian will return to its original home. People so decide for a safe margin. And then this, this is um, a week afterwards. Election is April 2nd. By April 7th, they have a party. As we go to President our forces participate and enjoy the celebration today of the return of the county to its old home, St. Joseph. We are unable to give a report of the, the doings in this issue. They're about to get drunk. About to do. The city has dressed in a manner which does justice to the community. The citizens from the small shop up to those who have known it since childhood realize that they are about to celebrate the greatest victory St. Joseph has ever known and nothing has been left undone to make it unparalleled in the history of Berrien County. All forms of decoration adorn the buildings along the lines of the arch. Business houses trying to sell each other in original and novel design, and while dwelling houses all over the city are more thoroughly draped than ever before in any past in our past celebration. Flags and appropriate and attractive banners and transparencies are suspended over the streets. The harmony is a witty motto of the national colors are our most conspicuous in all decorations. The citizens of Ben Harbor seem to bear turned out at, in mass, uh, have turned out in mass, and those from the surrounding county are joining the race. All kinds of conveniences are being utilized to get here. Conveniences, I'm sorry, being utilized to get here, and many of them will take part in the processes, which is in charge of James R. Clark, the chief marshal. The Laporte and three other bands furnish the music. And those present cannot help me really um, convince that St. Joseph realizes and appreciates the effort of those who gave us what was asked for. Prominent speakers will deliver addresses at the Academy and Preston's um, rink this afternoon. The magnificent display of fireworks will be given in the evening, which will be followed by a good time, the dancing at the Academy, a general good time, and hurrah for all. There's Plummer and Preston have. Issue proclamations requesting the citizens of Benton Harbor and St. Joe to participate in the Jubilee. So they're not even waiting. They're like, <laughs> party time, y'all. But of course, if you know anything, well, Tom does, he should, he's a judge. But it is not an uncommon thing for things like this to be challenged in a court of law. And it was. And in September, a writ of error was issued from the Supreme Court to review the decision of the circuit court and the county seat matter. The attorneys for the county are doing their best in the interest of the people of the county to have the matter heard and finally dispose of at the October term of the Supreme Court. So the election was in April. Technically, the county seat issue is not going to be determined until October. And actually, there was a, another kind of article that kind of made a comment that no, it was, I think it was like in like early October, like, guys, calm down. It hasn't been decided yet. Like, it, like this rumor got out that. Oh, it's been decided. Eventually, um, it would be decided in favor of St. Joe. But what I liked about this, and actually Johnny asked me if I had come across any political cartoons, and I said, no, and then I found this guy. What would happen is the election to move the county seat occurred in April. But in the November election that year, the county had to vote for the appropriations to build the buildings. And that's what that is. That's Berrien County will do her duty today and that's seventy thousand dollars in appropriations to go towards the new county seat. Um, the again, these are a little hard to read, but the top one is from uh, November third. Uh, November third, Lansing, Michigan. The Supreme Court has set aside the judgment of the court below and sustained the validity of the proceedings removing the county seat of Berrien County from Berrien Springs to St. Joseph 
this ends a long fight. So from what it sounds like, I would like to go back and try to find the actual court cases for that, which I don't know, maybe I will. We got a lot of court books in there. But it looks like the circuit court had struck it down and the Supreme Court said, no, we, it stands. It was a legal, it was a, it was a legal, uh, legal and valid election. Three days later in the weekly palladium, I found this guy. Several of the streetcars are adorned with flags in honor of the victory at Lansing in the county seat contest. So one of the things I am a little frustrated about is I'm gonna have to rewrite some of our interp downstairs because it makes the comment downstairs, and because I pulled this from other stuff that had been written, that as soon as the election was over, everything moved to St. Joe. That's clearly not true because it had to go through the court system to determine it was a valid election. So I found these two, and these were the last articles about the county seat I found in 1894. Prior to that, in the leading up to, if I look up county seat in 1894, a lot of like marriage license and probate court, and the standard announcements they were doing and had been doing for years. The top one says a circuit court convened at Berrien Springs Monday for the last term that will be held in the old county seat. So that was, that was November 11th, it was 11 11th. <laughs> we gotta go edit that guy. So that would have been probably about maybe like the week before. So that was the last, so we know, we know the first, the convenient, the first court convened here was April 11th, 1839. The last one was in early November, 1894. The bottom one says a circuit court will hold its last term of the court in the old county seat, taking it, uh, taking it, taking it in one way on November 20th. Um, but in another court will soon resume at the old county seat. The Board of Supervisors may have one more meeting at the Bering, at Bering Springs. It is rare that the old hitches is just in this way. I did look in 1895, and there was a couple I didn't use in here, but will be used in the exhibit. Um, there were a couple of grumblings from Bering Springs about the move, um, but by the, in everything I read, the goal was to have everything moved out by December 1st. So I have to go rewrite downstairs because it said the summer and that's what I had read from somebody else. I'm like, okay, that's great. And I'm like, oh, that's not a lie, it's December. So all I can imagine is them moving this entire, <laughs> I'm sure they were moving things before then that could be moved that were not a day-to-day -day necessity for the county, but officially the county seat started in St. Joe, December 1st, 1894. And they were in Martin's Music Hall and Academy Music Hall. They would remain there until the county seat or the county courthouse was built and open in April, May or something like early 1896, which would then remain the courthouse until it was torn down in the 60s. And so it's very interesting because periodically over the period of time, there's still some bitterness here and there. Actually, Brad, bless his heart, has been re, re putting, putting all these scrapbooks at the BCHA had in, its art in our early years, from the very early years of our organization. He's putting them back together because they've all fallen apart. And he goes, Was they, were they still bitter? I'm like, well, I'm sure there's still some bitterness here and there because St. Joe, you know, blew up and it became this big city and it's oh, St. Joe's a place to go. Although to be very fair, they were doing that without the county seat. They didn't need the county seat to continue to be this place of business and pleasure and vacationing. And we had the Whitcomb and, you know, the Bluff and all of that, you know, Silver Beach and the amusement park. But it helped. It helped immensely because there was other articles that saying, oh, such and even in 1894, oh, such and such tore down his building and built a new one, a nicer one, because we got the courthouse coming. So there was clearly some fashion thinking about it. But he was reading in those, and I've only glanced through them here and there for occasional purposes. <laughs> but he says that even in the writings, there's like this conversation about how people in Berrien Springs are still bitter you know, 60, 70 years later that they lost, you know, that they lost the county seat. And so it, it was still a conversation. And I was talking to Liz some months ago, and she said, apparently there was a rumor that they wanted to move the county seat back to Berrien Springs. I'm like, where the hell are we going to put a county courthouse at? <laughs> like that, unless they keep everything where it's at and then just have the heart of the county be back in Berrien Springs. Regardless, it was, it really was, it was an incredibly bitter election more bitter in 1880 than in 1894. And I was very fascinated to find that out. So when I went into this, my theory was 1894 was very bitter. It clearly was. Bering Springs was 
throwing it everything it could. Niles was whining and St. <laughs> Joe was slamming everyone as they could. Um, but clearly the days have passed and the county has not remained the same. Our identity has changed, it's shifted, and we now think of Bering Springs as this quaint little town, this little village with a lot of history, but no county seat. So that is the bitter battle that changed Bering County. And I will say left and right and center, I am very grateful for modern journalism ethics, but I miss the mudslinging of the old days. So, and that is the end. Are there any questions? None? All right. Well, thank you. So uh, this is gonna be a talk that will be available for public institutions who are interested in having us come give a lecture to them. We have chosen to kind of skirt all the old ones and come up with some new ones, and this will be one of them. As we continue to do research next door, this guy will probably be modified, especially once we get like into the journal era. Um, and I didn't put it in here, but my favorite quote does ever in history does come from the move from the journal, the Bering Springs era, that while the method of movement was done by, um, by horses, the means of transportation was done by jackasses of which St. Joe has plenty. <laughs> So um, again, don't let them fool you in saying that people were nice to each other in history because